Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started here because we're on a tight schedule. I was asked by Marco a minute ago what I thought about the conference, and everything is great except that he put me on the podium after Boyd. That wasn't fair. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I run the Aerospace Robotics Lab here at Stanford. Um, I'm sure that everybody in the room here knows that if you're going to do a uh, deployment of a robotic vehicle system, one of the most important things you have to deal with is navigation. That's what I'm going to talk about. In particular, what I want to talk about is some work that my lab has done working with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, Mimbari, on an A-STEP grant where we're trying to do uh, return to site, autonomous return to site missions in extreme environments using uh, an autonomous vehicle. The original motivation or the ultimate motiva motivation for this work is to take an AUV, autonomous underwater vehicle, and map the underside of an iceberg using sonar, uh, with, and then build a 3D representation of that underwater iceberg from the sonar and then use that as a world model in which to do navigation so we can do return to site missions to selected sites on that iceberg. The challenge here, one of the, there are several challenges. One of the challenges is that the iceberg is a non-inertial reference frame. It translates and rotates. That's the ultimate objective. What I'm actually going to talk about today is work that we've been doing to get ready for that mission, which is to do the same mission in Monterey Bay. Uh, the mission's the same. The hope is that Monterey Bay isn't moving quite as much as the icebergs is moving. Uh, but other than that, much of the, the mission's the same. Why would you want to do this? Don't have time to talk about much of the science, but let me just give you a couple little quick ones. Uh, scientists down at Mimbari, this is Bob Reinhook, uh, monitored a whale fall for over a period of three years, visited it multiple times, and in the process of this, discovered a whole new species of worms that exist apparently nowhere else in, except in decomposing whales. If you're interested in that, that's great. I'm not sure I am. Um, another scientist, uh, uh, Charlie Paul, monitors chemosynthetic sites on the seafloor. Uh, these are interesting not only for the biology, but also for the geology. Um, the, turns out a chemosynthetic site is a great indicator of what's going on underneath uh, the surface, where you have methane coming up, these surface, or these uh, communities thrive. Um, this is a chemosynthetic clam field at 2,900 meters depth out at about 25 kilometers off the shore of Moss Landing. Uh, and the next one, these are some chemosynthetic tube worms in a similar site. Uh, but the point is you want to watch how these sites evolve over time. So that's kind of the mission that we're looking for. How do we do it now? Uh, we can do return to site missions, but we do it typically with a remotely operated vehicle. The remotely operated vehicle, this is the Doc Ricketts dropping down through the moon pool on Mimbari. Western Flyer vehicle. That's a vehicle rated to 4,000 meters. It's got cameras, a uh, suite of science instruments. It's a tether to the surface, so it's driven by uh, people sitting up on the ship. Uh, how do we know where it is? You know where the ship is within a couple of meters. Um, from GPS, we have what's called a USBL ultra short baseline acoustic link to the vehicle. That gives you range and azimuth, and so you've got a rough idea of where the vehicle is on a very good day, five to 15 meters accuracy. You know where it is. What you really do, or on a normal day, you don't really have much of a clue. You've got very, very large errors, and the way this works is you put the vehicle down and you let, your pilot, let the pilots fly around until they find the site that you're interested in. What we want to do, has changed that whole mode of operation so we work with an autonomous vehicle. The vehicles we're working with are Dorado class AUVs. This is Mimbari's mapping vehicle. It's a five meter long vehicle. Sorry to mix units, but it's a 21 inch diameter um, uh, uh, form. Uh, these vehicles are packed full of instrumentations. Critical for this meeting, I don't know if we have a, a pointer, uh, but critical for this meeting is we've got a very nice IMU, or IMU. I don't know which button to push. Yeah, that one. Uh, so there's a, a, an inertial navigation system. Uh, there are computers that you can run estimators and whatnot. There are also multi-beam sonars, a suite of science instruments. Uh, this vehicle is rated to about 6,000 meters and about an 18-hour duration. By the way, this is almost exactly the same kind of vehicle they were using when they were searching for the uh, crash for the Thailand or the Malaysian aircraft. Um, how do you know where these vehicles are? Well, when you're on the surface, you've got a GPS lock. You know where they are within a few meters. 
Uh, when you're near the bottom, the inertial navigation system can lock onto the seafloor, and you've got about a 0.01 to a 0.05 percent distance traveled accuracy as possible, but it's only when you're in bottom lock. So the real problem is, if you're going to go out and visit a site, you're starting at the surface, you know where you are, you transit down 3,000 meters, uh, to the seafloor flying on free inertials while you're trying to get there. When you get down to the bottom, you're clueless in terms you've got hundreds of meters of error. You've got to knock out that drift if you have any hope of getting back to a site of interest. And that's what we've been working on. How do we do it? Well, we took a page out of the old uh, cruise missile um, approach, which is terrain relative navigation, which is you fly over your uh, area, you take uh, a series of sonar soundings which establish a shape, a ter terrain profile, which you then correlate with your pre-stored map, and that gives you a measurement of your location with respect to the map. In an ideal world, you'd have a nice Gaussian characteristic and you'd know where you are. In the real world, you have a very multimodal uh, characteristic and it's uh, kind of interesting on getting your filters to work. What we've actually implemented is a particle filter. I do not have uh, time to go into this. If you know about it, that's fine. Um, the important thing here is that basically we're using our inertial navigation measurement to fly the vehicle and we're updating the inertial navigation measurement with an estimate of where the map is with respect to that navigation. So the, the particle filter is estimating your position with respect to the map, the INS is estimating your position in the inertial, and we're adding that offset so that we can fly with respect to the map. How well does this work? It's, whoops, wrong button. Uh, so we had to do a few things to make it work, and we're building a vehicle uh, with two minutes left. Let's talk about how it works. Uh, we've run a series of recent field trials. This is Portuguese Ledge. It's in about 100 meters of water. That's about a kilometer across the field. These are features that stand about 30 meters off the seafloor. Uh, we had one day where we ran four separate profiles. These are four missions, uh, two on the top, two on the bottom here. Uh, the colors are if the uh, uh, if it's green, it means the TRN filter has converged and we have a very good estimate of where the map is with respect to our inertials. If it's red, it means we have not converged. If it's yellow, I didn't have a chance to talk about this, but that means that you're flying over uninteresting un terrain. You've sensed it and you shouldn't allow the filter uh, to update. The interesting bit here is in this little red box, what happens here is the filter enters the area, the vehicle enters the area flying on the inertials unconverged TRN estimate, it realizes at this point that it's an offset from the map. The vehicle, or the estimate immediately jumps to about a 20 meter offset. This map has a 20 meter offset from true inertials, a geo-referencing error. We just identified that, the estimate jumps up here and then the control system brings it in and it follows the rest of the path after that. So that's kind of interesting. How well does this filter work? This is a plot of the uh, estimate over five or four runs. You can see that they're all converging on about the same 20 meter offset. Uh, we've got, you know, 10 meters northings, and I think it's 15 meters e or five, well, whatever it is. Um, and they're all within the error bound that we had uh, predicted. So this is, it's working quite well. Uh, how well does it work in terms of a return to site capability? Well, the way we ran this mission is we drew a trajectory on a map. Now remember the map has a 20 meter offset uh, and trying to go over this target location, that's a target boulder. Had we flown on pure inertials, we would have flown this dash line and we would have missed the target location altogether. What we actually flew, however, was this mission right here when we went right over the site. So we're pretty excited about this. To our knowledge, this is the first ever demonstration of this kind of a capability in an AUV operating out in the ocean. So with that, I'm out of time and I can't talk any faster. Yes. Very good question. Uh, with the seafloor, how do we generate the map to begin with? Uh, I didn't talk about that. This was just localization. When we're working on the seafloor, the mapping technology with the mapping AUV that I showed is very well developed. We know how to run patterns over the seafloor, collect the map, and then do an offline adjustment or an offline solution to find a, a good estimate of the map, or excuse me, of the, of the terrain. The more interesting thing is on the iceberg, since you're trying to do a map on a moving target, 
Uh, and that's a whole other talk. We actually have some work that we've done on that, and it, we think we know how to do that as well. That's a great question. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Okay.